Welcome to the Life After Sugar podcast. The podcast that's not just about sugar, but about your relationship with it and also with food and especially with yourself. So if you want to discover your life after sugar and hear inspiring stories from all kinds of people who also cut out sugar in their way, at their pace, for their own reasons, this is the podcast for you. Because you know, when you take away the sugar, you can finally discover the real sweetness in your life. I'm your host, Netta Gorman. And in this week's episode, I'm talking with Bethany, who is a self-identified recovering sugar addict, who's struggled with food, sweets, weight and dieting for as long as she can remember. And she has a very insightful and touching story that I'd like to share with you in just a minute. Just before we get to my chat with Bethany, I'd like to say that if this is your first time here, then welcome and thank you for listening to this podcast. And whether you're new or a regular and you haven't yet rated or reviewed this podcast, could I ask you to scroll down and tap on the stars to rate this podcast and also to write a short review to let me know how this podcast is helping you in your life after sugar. I love reading your reviews. And when you rate and review this podcast, not only does it encourage me to continue making new episodes, but it also helps to share this podcast and have more people see it so that we can help more people feel better and lose weight with less sugar. So again, thank you for rating and reviewing this podcast and for spreading the word about sugar. Okay, so let's get to my chat with Bethany. All right, so today I'm talking with Bethany. And Bethany, um, can you tell us a little bit about your background with food and specifically with sugar? Sure. Um, I have struggled with food and eating and weight as long as I can remember. So even as a child, I can remember climbing up on countertops to reach cookies that were high up in the cupboard. And then, you know, one was never enough to satisfy me. Um, I can remember scheming ways to get more than my share at, you know, gatherings like church potlucks or Halloween, bartering with my younger sister to get half of her stash um, when mine was all gone. Mm -hmm. And my allowances were spent very quickly at the corner store, usually on chocolate, right? So um, as a chubby child, I was often put on diets. Um, my, My parents thought that my weight was something to be fixed, a problem to be solved, right? So I can remember following my mom's Weight Watchers plan even before I was old enough to be there myself. Yeah. And then in high school, my weight's up and down, right? But the only down came with very restrictive meal plans and a lot of exercise, right? And as soon as there was this tiny crack in that restrictive plan, I blew it wide open with a free-for-all mindset, devouring everything that had previously been forget- forbidden, which was often the things like sugar, pastries, cookies, things like that, right? So um, and then I was always just really hungry for like, like figuratively hungry for knowledge about what's actually going to work, right? So I even completed my undergraduate degree thesis on self-esteem and dieting um, in the psychology program and analyzing thousands of survey responses to try and discover some answers. Um, and then as an adult, I tried everything I could think of to lose weight. So that was like Weight Watchers, therapy for emotional eating self-help books, different eating plans, um, you know, slow carb diet, juice fasting, um, gluten-free, more Weight Watchers. I even became a Weight Watchers leader at one point um, because I thought, okay, it's only working when my calories are restricted and I didn't feel good when I ate their, their low point products though, those things with, you know, sugar alcohols. And so Eventually, I became disillusioned with the whole enterprise because I saw people coming back again and again and again to start over just as I had done, right? And each time their starting weight was heavier than before. So, and I tried just eating healthy as best as I could, right? Making things from scratch, 
I did not know about sugar at the time. So I would make things like blueberry pie and <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Um, it was better than store-bought and food and yeah. processed, right? Well, you know, my weight kind of soared and eventually I gave up weighing myself at that point. Every time I embraced an eating plan, I had fresh hope, right? And and then at the end of each one, I hadn't achieved my goals or I had, and then the weight would come back on. And then I would just get so disappointed with myself and my lack of ability to lose the weight. I would beat myself up for not sticking to it. I would beat myself up for caving, for being weak or failing. And um, yeah, I just felt like, what what is wrong with me? I'm a smart woman. I've earned an undergraduate degree in psychology, a master's in social work, and I still can't figure this out what's going on. Yeah, it's Um, frustrating to think that you have the info or the theory, what's that space between, ha- you know, of possessing the theory and actually doing what you need to do to lose the weight? Like, what was there a hole in the info that you knew? Yes, actually, because I did not know about sugar addiction. Right. And so when I did, I had tried keto. So that's definitely restricting the sugar But when I did keto, I did it with all the sweeteners. Mm -hmm. And so making, you know, the keto cheesecake, the keto fat bombs, the keto mug cakes. And, you know, I thought this is fantastic. I get to have dessert every single night. (laughs) Um, And surprise, surprise, you know, I didn't do that well um, in terms of weight loss or my gut health. Those, Those sweeteners really didn't help me out because they kept me hooked on the sweet. Um, but they also started to destroy my gut bacteria, I found out later. Yeah. Right? And so there were some benefits definitely for keto, right? That I had more sustained energy and better moods, not so hangry, but it was, you know, it wasn't working for me. And I, the gap in knowledge, I really believe was about sugar and, and the addictive properties of sugar mm-hmm. and what can happen when you give it up. So that's what sort of then led me into the sugar addiction space. Um, And, uh, and I came in with a, I was kicking and screaming, I would say. Yeah, me too. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We're kickers and screamers. Yeah, because we don't want to think about like your, your title of your podcast, Life After Sugar. We don't want to think about that because we can't imagine not being able to have that because we've come to rely on it in very unhealthy ways. Right. So, yeah. So I came, I came into that space still wanting to lose weight. I thought this is now the answer to my problems that if I give up the sugar and the sweeteners, um, maybe I can lose the weight. Right. So, um, and, and giving up the sugar part wasn't so difficult because with keto, I had kind of done that. Then I had to give up the sweeteners too. And that was a bit more difficult, Mm -hmm. Um, but I had some support to do it. And I tried that out. Um, But then, you know, it, it got also quite restrictive for me. Right. So then you're looking for kind of trace amounts of sugar or fruits, you know, that I do think that, that most people can have whole fruits depending on what they are, but it depends on what it does for your own body. Right. So, you know, so berries, right. That's something that wasn't sweet to me at the beginning, but your taste buds change. And now I find them quite sweet and I can have some of those berries and it doesn't affect me. But the program that I was doing at the time, that was a big no, no, you know, not to, you know, squeeze a lemon into hot water, not to, you know, have any berries or any kind of trace of fructose, not to put a dash of uh, I never know how to say this, Worcester sauce, Worcestershire <laughs> sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire <laughs> sauce, thank you. I will practice that. Um, so not to put a dash of that when I make homemade burgers um, because, oh, there's a little bit of sugar in that and and you're only adding a little bit. So anyway, it was a bit crazy making for me to be that level of abstinent. Um, and so that restriction, given my history of, you know, 30, 40 years of restricting, it was too much, right? So I had to then come to a place where I understood recovery a little bit better, right? And that also realizing, hey, there's nothing wrong with me. (laughs) Um, so, So looking at what is diet culture, what has that done to me in terms of my mindset? 
And then how do I recover from both the sugar addiction and the diet mentality? Yeah, totally. Yes, yes. I'm actually in the process of writing about that in my future book (laughs) about this diet culture that actually has us, I'd like to talk to you about this, but it, I believe it has us believing that restriction, you know, one person's restriction is another person's freedom. And then there's shades of gray in between all of that. And, and it's funny because people are convinced for me, at least that I eat a very restrictive diet and I've never felt more free. So is it about perception like when you said that you felt restricted in the past, how does that actually feel or how did that feel for you as opposed to how you feel now, which I think I imagine is free? Yeah, I do feel a lot more free now. Um, I know for myself what how to eat, right? So I can eat my own way now. So it's it's not exactly keto. It's not exactly paleo. It's not exactly whole 30. You know, it's I don't follow now all the rules of those plans. I eat in a way that works for me and I can still keep designing what that looks like and it might change over time. Right. And so that's where some of the freedom comes in, too. Because if I feel that I have to follow the rules, you know, perhaps to either get into ketosis or follow a carnivore, I've done carnivore as well, right? So following that, then, oh, you have this little bit of something and now you're not doing the plan, right? But these are somebody else's rules and those might work for other people. I'm not here to deny that there are many benefits of those ways of eating for many people. Uh, But for me, I have to design my own plan. And I think when I work with clients too, I help them design their own plan. So sometimes they'll say to me, well, is it okay if I have this? Is it okay if I have dairy? Is it okay if I have, you know, and and I think, well, is it okay for you? And then we talk about that. And how will you know if it's okay for you? Does it trigger cravings? Does it make you want more? Are you able to eat a moderate amount? Or do you maybe need to abstain from that food because it makes you a bit crazy, right? Mm -hmm. It makes it it lights up this mental obsession for you. Right. So, so I often like to talk to clients too, about designing a seatbelt that fits you perfectly. Right. So you found what that is for you, Netta, um, and, and the way that you eat. So we don't ever want to, um, not wear a seatbelt because we'd feel very unsafe. And if the seatbelt is far too loose, we feel unsafe But if it's too tight, perhaps because of history of restriction, then we can't wait to get it off, you know, and then it's not going to do its job either. We can't live with it. Yeah, that's a wonderful analogy. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. And and the the seatbelt, just to continue your analogy, is different for different people. You know, I often say there's eight billion of us on this planet. Surely we can't all be the same. Right. And there isn't a one size fits all for the seatbelt. And there isn't a one size fits all in the way that we eat. We have, you know, sometimes we have health issues that we're trying to fall or trying to solve. We have, you know, um, our own list of abstinent foods, right? Because even if you're not having sugar necessarily, and you get that out, you might find that, say, pineapple, for example, you can't stop, or peanuts, you can't stop or cashews, whatever, whatever it is, right? So you might find that you just can't stop those things. And so that then makes you a little bit obsessed. You know, you've got these cravings again. So maybe that's not a good food for you, even though it might not have any sugar in it, right? So this is what we're, you know, we get some obvious things out of the way and then we have to tailor make things. Yes. Yeah. I found that, you know, over and above the, you know, highly palatable, highly refined and processed products that I don't Mm -hmm. even embrace with the word food, like chips or cookies or, you know, the obvious ones, um, the ones that can also trigger cravings in many, many, many people, uh, so-called healthy foods. And they, it's not about the food. It's about your relationship with the food and how you behave with that food. So for me, it's bread. You know, right. and bread's been a staple for thousands of years. And here I am 
getting all sneaky and, oh, you know, uh, trying to sneak extra. And it's just not healthy for me to eat bread because of how I behave around it. It's not the bread the problem. It's who I become. Exactly. Yeah. And for other people, it can be cheese or nuts, as you were saying, you know, and it's like sometimes I feel it's the mix between crunchy and salty for the nuts. Mm -hmm. And cheese is relatively salty. Maybe it's fat and salt together, even if they're, yeah. you know, there's some kind of combination that triggers yeah. some people. Exactly, exactly, right? And you think about the combinations that actually come in nature, right? So these nuts don't come salted. <laughs> they don't even come, you know, readily available to eat a large quantity, right? That you would have to break open all the shells. It might take you an hour, you know, to get a handful um, and so we think about how they come in nature. Um, and I, I believe that there is no food that comes with both fat and sweet um, yeah. in nature, except breast milk, right? True. Um, and that's very intentional, right? That's by design so that babies can grow very yeah. quickly. You know? But we're all weaned um, now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that we don't have those kinds of foods in nature, right? And so, yeah, sometimes it is these combinations and the food industry knows it, right? Yeah, totally. Oh, they exploit it. You know, they invest millions and make billions out of that. They know that simple right. bit of information. That if we know now as consumers, that can take us one step closer to giving the finger to the food industry. Right. And along with that, to the diet industry as well. Right. Right. Because they are also there, you know, these programs that they have um, are are not, they're not necessarily designed to be successful long term. Because if they were, then the diet industry would lose clients and customers. And I have to say, you know, and I've followed things like Weight Watchers in the past, um, that the whole concept of long term was not on my radar. I had you know, a goal. And most people I think I've come across have this relatively short term goal of losing X number of pounds, or getting into this dress size for this date, and nothing over and above that, because it's just too overwhelming, first, to think of long term. And second, it's like, but I don't want to eat like this long term. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why they don't work. Yeah. Right, because you can do this restriction for a while, but then what happens? Right, eventually the wheels fall off, and then we don't look at these diet plans as being something that failed us. We look at ourselves, we point the finger back at ourselves, and we say, I couldn't do it, I couldn't stick to it, I didn't have enough willpower. Yeah, it's it's self defeating and self-destructive in my experience and I don't think I'm the only one no you're not the only one for Mm -hmm. sure right so so when I think about you know how things have gone for me now so all of these epiphanies that I had along my journey and all the recovery work has actually not just translated into losing weight right and that surprised me and i will i will be honest it disappointed me as well cuz i thought once i get off the sugar and the flour you know and and live in this recovery space that isn't so restrictive right but i think that you know this is the way forward and i have some freedom mental freedom then the weight will just come off because you hear this all the time and then you'll just fall to a right size body Right. And so some somewhere along the way for me, the goal of weight loss that used to be in my number one goal for decades and decades and decades, that had to fall to a lower priority in order for me to achieve this level of freedom. I think mm. Because having having peace now with my food and then being at peace with myself, that somewhere along the line became the number one goal instead of losing weight. Right. Yeah, that is powerful, because we hold on to this goal of losing weight, despite proof to the contrary, in other words, that it's making us feel like crap about ourselves, basically. But we hold on to it because we believe, well, I'm the problem. Right, right. So let's think about, let's talk about the bathroom scale. Can we talk about the bathroom scale for a while? Yeah, sure. (laughs) Um, 
because this is something that we use as a, we believe we're using it as a tool to keep ourselves on track, right? Or to keep ourselves heading in the right direction. Um, and that can be true for some people, right? I know some people, they just have a regular routine that they weigh themselves, say once a week or once a month. And that's good information for them to have because they don't have this complicated relationship with food and weight and, and addiction and everything. So that's fine, you know, but for other people like myself, that number on the scale would dictate whether I had a good day or a bad day, right? I weigh myself first thing in the morning, of course, with no clothes on, of course, before I have anything to drink, of course, after I use the bathroom, you know, because you need that number to be as low as possible. And I would anticipate, okay, what is that number going to be? based on how I, if I had been a good girl or a bad girl, mm -hmm. right? So all of the, these mental games are happening, right? And so then you step on the scale and you, you see the number. And I've actually learned now there is a bit of a dopamine hit. If we talk about, you know, sugar giving us a dopamine hit, um, but there is a dopamine hit that comes from that moment when you step on the scale, that anticipation, what is the number going to be, right? And so when we get that number, if that doesn't match up with our expectations, we're disappointed, mm. right? But even if we have lost weight, we can still be disappointed because we feel like, mm, but that wasn't enough. That, yeah. that, that didn't align with how much work I put in this week, right? How much I deprived myself this week or how, how much I worked out or whatever it is. Right. So regardless of what that number is, whether it goes up or down or stays the same, we get disappointed and then we carry that into our day and we let it dictate how our day is going to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think there's, there's probably not millions of people listening, but whoever's listening can totally relate to what you just described. And even someone like me, who's not, you know, I've been in the diet mentality, even though I didn't have a huge amount of weight to lose it, got to me as well what you're describing that dopamine hit that self-judgment mm -hmm. how your day is sort of shaped by that number on the scale how your self self-worth your self-worth yeah just from that number like why do we do that to ourselves right I want to take a quick break to say that if you're looking for some free resources about how to cut sugar, then I have plenty for you. Come check out the Life After Sugar Facebook page and subscribe to the Life After Sugar YouTube channel, as well as my Instagram account at mylifeaftersugar. You can also check out my TikTok account at netta underscore lifeaftersugar. And if cravings are getting in the way and causing you to fall off the wagon, then I have five tips for you, especially if you're an intermittent faster, to help you get rid of cravings. Go to aftersugarclub.com and download your five tips today. And if we think about the number itself, right, you can think about um, so for example, from the BMI, right? So the body mass index that this, this measure that tells us whether we are healthy weight, overweight, obese, morbidly obese, even underweight, you know, and sometimes these things are just a one pound difference, right? You're changing categories from overweight to obese in one pound or mm -hmm. healthy to overweight in one pound, right? And so, you think about that, that is really crazy making, you know, that's, that's the same thing that we do with our age sometimes that we think, oh, well, now I turned 50. Now everything is downhill. Now everything's going to fall apart. Well, no, because yesterday I was 49. And today I'm 50. What what actually changed? Nothing, right? <laughs> so it's it's similar for the scale that we give the number a lot of power to tell us how we're doing and how, you know, um, how healthy we are. But actually this correlation between health and weight is not what we think it is. 
right? So many, many, many people have a longer lifespan. They have, um, you know, better fitness, better health outcomes, even if they're in the overweight or obese categories. And some people who are in the healthy ranges can be very unwell and unfit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm one of them. You know, I often say weight is not the only measure of health. And, you know, and and I almost feel guilty about saying I've been slim all my life. It's like, don't hate me, (laughs) you know, Um, but I had lots of different health issues and very many of them were not. Well, I would say most of them had nothing to do with my weight. Right. Exactly. Right. And we know now you and I know, right. Sugar has a lot more to do with our health. Um, then weight has to do with our health, right? So when we get off the sugar, even if your weight doesn't change, you're giving up, you know, inflammation, you're giving up the blood sugar roller coaster, you're giving up potential for insulin resistance and diabetes and all of these things. There's a huge list, as you know, right? So that's, that's what we get to do when we give up the sugar. And if we came to um, giving up sugar because we thought it would help us lose weight, you know, that may be true for you or it may not be true for you. We don't know. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And if, if that is our expectation or our belief and then it doesn't materialize, then we're stuck in the diet mentality yet again of, you know, this is supposed to work and it doesn't. And this concept of working again brings us back only to weight and weight loss and not to health exactly and and it can bring us back to society's expectations you know like these standards are out there everywhere you know and and many of us grew up with this as well right so I had a lot of work to do in um, shedding the expectations that you know that you can only be beautiful if you are thin yeah. Um, and, you know, I grew up with that and I don't fault my parents because they, you know, they did the best they could with what they had. Yeah. Right. But this was just how they grew up as well. You can't be overweight and beautiful. That just doesn't work. Yeah, right? it's yes, it's crazy. And and it's sad because we we internalize that and we carry it around with us most of our adult life. And this and that's why I'm curious to know what is it about how you live and how you eat now and how you see yourself that makes you feel so free now? Mm, Yeah. Well, I think when I talked about trading that goal of weight loss being my number one goal and uh, peace with food being my number one goal, right? So um, that really helped because weight can be so complicated in terms of um, what affects our weight, right? All kinds of things affect our weight far more than what we've let, been led to believe. We think because of the, usually the diet industry, we think that we can control it by what we eat and how much we move, right? But those are only two factors in a list of about 50 that actually impact our weight. So, you know, things like our gender, our genes, our hormones, um, our stress levels, like cortisol in our in our the stress in our body, the stress hormone cortisol can wreak havoc with our weight. So anyway, there's all these other factors that we then um, discount because we think, oh, it's just about what I eat and and how much I move, right? So it, so for example, when I was in the diet mentality and Let's let's just take Weight Watchers, for example. I'm not trying to pick on Weight Watchers, but it is a good example because you count points, right? So you count, you get a certain number of points in a day and that's your more or less your calorie allotment, right? So, um, so then I could think, all right, can I eat this cookie and still lose weight, hmm. right? So that that's how I'm thinking. My decision on whether to eat the cookie is whether or not I can lose weight. Mm. Right. So, and I could usually eat a cookie and still lose weight. Mm-hmm. Right. I could maybe compensate in other areas, or if it just happened to be only one cookie, you could get away with it. Or, you mm-hmm. know, and all these things start to come into play where you game the system. Right. 
if so I, I really didn't know if eating a cookie would impact my weight or not. There was not really a direct correlation there. Now, if I think about peace with food as my goal, what could I do? If I eat the cookie, does that bring me peace with food? Absolutely not. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I have I have run this experiment on myself. And for me, I eating one cookie does not bring me closer to peace with food. You know, all of a sudden I am, the obsessions are kicking up again. I'm thinking, how do I get more? How can I access more? You know, then it's every night I want cookies and I'm having more and more cookies, you know, because once I get that sugar, then um, my body just wants more and more. And it's uh, my whole, it takes over my, all my thoughts, right? Now I'm all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh, where are the best cookies in town and how can I get there? Are they open or closed? Should I spend cash so that I don't leave any kind of, you know, budget trail? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy making. So I know for sure there's a direct correlation. If I eat the cookie or whatever else it is, I know I will not have peace with food. So I can make a decision then yeah. based on that. That's amazing. Yes, that is a real reframe from will I lose weight to will I have peace with food? You know, and I mean, we can say it and it sounds easy enough, but it can be a lifetime's work to get to that reframe. And for you, what does peace with food actually feel like or look like? Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of what it looks like, definitely I have my own list of red light foods or trigger foods, right? So and these are the things that are either processed or they have sugar in them. Uh, not a natural sugar, but a refined sugar. Um, usually it's a combination of sugar and fat. Um, those are the things that will really light me up. So things like, you know, donuts or ice cream or cookies. Um, so, yeah, so I know that those things are off the table. So what it looks like practically is that I, I abstain from those things. And I find freedom in that because I find the peace with food. The mental chatter is quiet, you know. I don't have to worry about all of these things um, kicking into action or trying to, um, you know, um, sn being sneaky about food, because that's a big issue for me is that, you know, having things, if nobody knows I ate it, <laughs> you know, then it didn't really happen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I so, used to think if I eat this chocolate fast enough, my body won't realize I've eaten it. <laughs> <laughs> all these games we play, right? Yeah, but the peace with food looks like radical honesty, um, making time for quiet in my life, um, being accountable, you know, having self-compassion, heaps of grace and gratitude. You know, those are some of the things that lead me closer to peace with food, right? So, so for me, peace with food means I can eat because we have to eat. We can't just abstain from food altogether. But I can eat and I can plan meals in a way that um, I don't have all kinds of mental chatter about it. I don't have this debate going back and forth, like, should I have this or shouldn't I have this? You know, I know more or less what my safe foods are and I can eat those and be very satisfied. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yes, I share that with you. And that, I think, is where that sense of freedom comes from and the absence of restriction. Right, right, exactly. So I think when you get those comments that you mentioned, Netta, that people think, oh, that's so restrictive. Like I've heard that too. Oh, you don't eat sugar? Like that's, I couldn't do that. That's too restrictive, right? Well, it depends how you do it, right? And I think, and it depends what it means for you, right? So when I first got into, you know, this space, um, learning about sugar addiction, it was very restrictive, you know, and then I felt like I couldn't maintain that I couldn't do it because that was taking out, you know, all fruits, all trace amounts, you know, and that didn't work for me. I know other people that works well for them and they find freedom in that. Yes. Right. So it's that seatbelt analogy. That seatbelt is too tight for me, but it probably it could work for you, you know, or that one is too loose for me, but it could work for you. 
Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think that also the diet culture has stolen from us this ability to think for ourselves, decide for ourselves, experiment for ourselves and make our own damn rules. Right. And I find that that happens a lot. Like when I start working with someone and they're coming in with diet mentality, it takes a lot of work to get rid of that because they're constantly thinking, is this okay? Can I have this? You know, and they're looking for those rules and those boundaries, you know, um, just like kids do, right? When we're parenting them, they're constantly looking for these, where are these rules? I need to feel safe. I need to know if I'm good or not. Yes, the diet culture treats us like children quite honestly I it's they stop us from growing up you know and I speak for myself when I say this yeah 100% I think because we're constantly looking for external sources of whether we're doing well or not external sources of validation since you put away the scale right you do you not weigh yourself at all I don't I don't and that's been about a year Um, And I have had some experiences at doctor's offices where they want to weigh me. And, um, and I think if that's necessary, you go ahead and you write it down, but don't tell me what the number is. Don't show me what the number is. Can we do this in that way? And I've had various experiences with that. Some doctors are, you know, that's the first time maybe they've had that request. Others, it's clearly not the first time they've had that request. You know, they put uh, one doctor's office put a, it was a floor scale. They put a sticky note over the screen and they, they had it pointing towards them so they could just lift up the corner of the post-it note and, uh, and they could see the number and I didn't have to see the number. Okay. So, yeah. So I think, I think letting go of not weighing myself sometimes can be a bit anxiety provoking. Yeah, because we've done it for so long and we've relied on that number for so long. And my first thought was, if I don't weigh myself, I'm going to just gain weight. Right. And how does that? Yeah. And I've heard that many times, you know, where uh, people have said, yeah, I can't put away the scale because then I'll put on weight. And I'm like, but the action of putting away the scale will not in and of itself make you put on weight. That's a bit facetious on my part. But um, what is it? Are you, what are you worried about? Or what were you worried about when you put away the scale? What would you, what would happen? Would you would hell break loose and you just eat everything? Yeah. Right? Yes. And that comes from the restrictive mentality that I had, you know, had for so long. Because if I put away the scale and I don't know how much I weigh, how will I beat myself back into submission if the if the number is getting out of hand, right? And it, um, I I was always using this external number to tell me how I'm doing, mm. you know. And I didn't, I I just came to the conclusion I didn't need that. I didn't want to do that anymore. But it was scary at the beginning. So then you have to look for other indicators of how you're doing. And you want to build those indicators so that you actually do have some control over them. So like what I talked about, the piece with food, right? I have control over that with how I eat, you know, so and the choices I make, I can see the direct impact. So, you know, how how am I doing? That's the big question. That's what we're asking the scale. How am I doing? Right. So so let's think about how are you doing without knowing a number on the scale? How are you doing? You know, and if it, and if it's about a size thing, you can think about how your clothes fit. Okay, that's fine. Um, but how else are you doing? You know, okay. are you feeling well rested? Are you finding joy? Are you having, you know, a, an attitude of gratitude towards things? Are you, you know, knocked off kilter by things that are happening in your life? Or do you have some resilience? You know, do you have some emotional awareness to be able to get through your day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So finding other indicators, I think, is um, is a very helpful thing when you're giving up the scale. Yes. Yes. Agreed. And it's almost like if the scale's not there, then we're all looking for alternative ways to measure our weight or weight loss rather than reframing to, you know, again, weight is not the only measure. It's probably a pretty crappy measure of your health. And, and the same with sugar, you know, people are looking for alternatives, sweet tasting alternatives to sugar. And we come along and say, yeah, actually, um, you can replace sugar with 
you know, more energy and feeling more positive and all the rest of it. And that has nothing to do with taste or food. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There are all kinds of other measures out there, but we've been really blinded to think that weight is, is the best measure or the only measure. Yeah. Yes. And actually for lots and lots of people, I think looking at things in terms of weight is actually one of the unhealthiest things we've ever done to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I, you know, when I, when I was working with some people on this, I thought, okay, a hundred years ago, people didn't have scales in their homes, you know, and how did they weigh themselves? They didn't. And they were okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They didn't have apps a hundred years ago. (laughs) They didn't have them 10 years ago. And we were fine. Thank you very much. And also what they didn't have is all these processed foods, the hyper palatable foods that, you know, got us overweight, probably most of us in the first place. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I just want to finish off with what you were saying about weight is more complex than just cutting sugar. And I would add flour. I think you add flour as well to that equation. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's easy enough. It's a bit simplified, isn't it? Just to say, well, just cut sources of sugar and flour and, you know, you'll lose weight. Right. Apart from the fact that here we are saying, hang on, weight is not the only measure of health. For your own personal experience, what was it that was more complex than just, and I put just in air quotes, cutting sugar and flour? Mm-hmm. So you mean in, in terms of my weight? Yeah. Yeah. So stress is a big one, right? So um, you can find um, that your stress levels will impact your weight. Um, and so if you're going through a stressful situation, it it may also lead you to eat more because of emotional eating and things like that. But even if you don't do that, your weight can, you know, your body, it's almost like your body says, we're going through a hard time. Don't leave me now. Right. <laughs> um, like says to the fat, um, you know, or to the weight, don't leave me now because we're going to go through this hard time. Right. And your body actually works against you. Um, if you are trying actively trying to lose weight, right, it's going to push back because it likes homeostasis. It likes things to stay the same. Right. So for me personally, definitely stress um, has been something that impacts my weight. I can actually see that stress impacts my blood sugar as well, even if I don't eat anything different. Mm. You know, you you can go into stressful situations. And if I've worn a continuous glucose monitor, I can see the spike that happens, even if it's unrelated to food. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I've had yeah. That so, experience. yeah. Yeah. So your body really does it. I I look at our bodies as just such a, a an amazing symphony of things that are going on. Hormone levels can also affect weight, right? So we've got leptin and ghrelin, right? So the leptin um, is the satiety hormone. The ghrelin is the hunger hormone. So sometimes those get out of balance depending on what we've done um, to our bodies and our eating patterns or perhaps things that we're going through in life, like stressful situations. So those can get out of whack. Sometimes even other hormones, um, you know, for women, you know, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, all of these hormones can also get out of balance and they can cause issues in your weight as well. Um, Could be thyroid related, could be adrenal glands related, you know, so all of these things, I mean, have factored into my own journey um, at various points too. And some of those health issues I'm still trying to solve, but now I'm trying to solve them independently of my weight. And I also have that seatbelt that those guardrails to know I'm not going to sugar about, yeah. you know, if I things get stressful, I'm not going to sugar. Um, so th- my weight might fluctuate a little bit and we get through life that way but I'm not going to turn to sugar because I know that doesn't work for me. Yeah, that's great. That is so empowering to hear. And I imagine for you to experience. Yeah, it's a completely different way of thinking about things. And it does take time. It's not if I could give people, you know, if I could help them flip a switch or give them something that would, you know, turn this around for them and give them different thinking about it, I would definitely do that. 
right? But it takes time. Everybody has their own journey and you do need to go through some things to be able to learn and unlearn um, some of these things that we've picked up along the way. Yeah, I agree 100%. Yes, yes. You know, it. we just need to keep spreading the message and preaching, not preaching, but being examples of what feeling free from sugar looks like. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Not what you look like, but what it looks like. Right. Yeah. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> if someone wants to get in touch with you, Bethany, how can they do that? Sure, they can. Um, so I have I have a website. I do a number of things, and coaching people on sugar and food addiction is one of them. Um, and so you can reach me at Bethany at simplicated.com. And so simplicated is S Y M P L I C A T E D dot com. Right. Yeah. I'll put that with the show notes with this episode. It's lovely to talk to you, Bethany. You too, Netta. We're like kindred spirits. Yes, I know. And I know that our listeners can't see this today, but we're both wearing hot pink. Yeah. <laughs> and that says it all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bethany. You're so welcome. Oh, wow. Well, I wasn't kidding when I was saying that Bethany and I are like soul sisters, kindred spirits, not just because we're both living in Canada, but because we see peace with food and especially peace with sugar as the yardstick for how we're feeling and how we live our lives. As Bethany said, it's not about your weight. It's about how you feel. And don't get me started on the diet culture that has us believing since we were teenagers that it is about your weight, that weight is synonymous with health. I cannot disagree more. And if you grew up in the diet culture like I did, then it's probably permeated into your belief system and will take some shaking to get rid of. And believe me, that's not easy to do, to shake off the diet culture. And shaking off the diet culture and concentrating on how you feel, not just how you look, is what the After Sugar Club is all about. If you're ready and committed to your own well-being and to improving your health by cutting sugar, And if you want to be with other like-minded people, then join us in the After Sugar Club. Not only will you get the support of our lovely group, but you'll also get to talk to me live on our check-in calls to get your questions answered and especially to get those mindset shift and aha moments that are central to feeling peace with sugar, with food and with yourself. Go to AfterSugarClub.com and click on the big green button to see everything that's included. Go to AfterSugarClub.com and click on the big green button to join us. Thank you for listening. That's it for this week. Keep in touch and see you soon for another episode.